Hello, and welcome to Overconfidence, the 37th episode in our Crossing Thin Ice podcast series, brought to you by Actuarial Risk Management. My name is Max Rudolph, and as always, I'm joined by Dave Ingram. We are all overconfident. Who among us hasn't predicted an event that we're still waiting to occur? A little humility, along with encouraging alternative opinions and robust stress tests, can lead to value being added by the risk team. Before we go on, I want to mention that nothing we say here is intended to be investment advice. We are here to provide educational material for risk managers. You can find all our podcasts on our Podbean homepage or your favorite podcast service. We hope that you will also take advantage of our free newsletter and webcast for additional education on various risk topics. Let's get started exploring overconfidence. I'm really sure that this will be an interesting podcast. But then, I've always been an overconfident speaker. In the case of public speaking, I think you need to be somewhat overconfident, or else you'd never say anything. There are many realms, like speaking, where overconfidence might be needed to get you off of square one. Things like writing, a new fitness routine, or a diet. But there's a lot of danger in overconfidence when you're a senior executive of an insurance company. Insurance, where premiums are collected ahead of claims, is a business where overconfidence often occurs, also often ends up resulting in large problems. An overconfident insurance manager might underprice their policies, they might embark on investment strategies that are much riskier than assumed, and they may fail to adapt the changes in the environment along with a host of other optimisms. One of the primary jobs of the chief risk officer is to look out for overconfidence and to figure out a way to protect the company from the consequences. But overconfidence can also afflict the CRO. The job of CRO in an insurer requires an incredibly wide range of skills and experience, including quantitative analysis, strategic thinking, communications, leadership, influencing, change management, in addition to specific knowledge of risk management, regulatory and rating agency requirements, and comprehensive knowledge of every activity within the insurer. Someone who is successful at the CRO job probably needs the services of the ancient Roman memento mori, the person who rode along with the general who is celebrating a triumph in a parade and whispered in their ear that they are still mortal. The temptations to overconfidence for the CRO all boil down to the same thing giving too much weight to their own opinions rather than the emerging real-world experiences. Examples of this include delayed recognition of emerging risk. Nassim Taleb gave the name black swan to the type of emerging risks that are not recognized in advance but have highly negative consequences and are retroactively declared to have been predictable. Things like the 2008 financial crisis and the 2020 COVID pandemic fall into this category. Another is over-reliance on complicated models. The output of complicated risk models are often presented as facts, as a way of developing a willingness to make decisions based on these outputs. But in actuality, these conclusions from the models fundamentally flow from decisions made by the modelers themselves about the relationship between the past experience and possible futures. If the CRO has been the final arbiter in decisions regarding model assumptions, they are likely to be invested in those decisions and reluctant to make changes. They know that the model loses credibility with many audiences if the findings change too much or too frequently. So the CRO might overconfidently over-rely on the models. They could also disregard input from the trenches. The executives of some insurers spend too much of their time talking to each other and not enough time talking to the people who are personally experiencing the business environment. Often, new trends, both good and bad, are first felt at the fringe of the organization's reach by the salespeople who are talking to customers and by the customer service staff who are handling questions. But the CRO, who has no natural connections to either of those two sets of people in the trenches, may become overconfident with using the information that they receive via their risk reports. Another issue could be overpromising on risk mitigations, 
when there's a new product at an insurer, a really good CRO will be at work during the product development phase, working with the product development team to identify any new mitigation programs that are needed. The CRO is likely aware that all existing risk mitigation programs are not executed perfectly, but the temptation is there with a new mitigation to initially evaluate it as if ex execution were perfect. In reality, sometimes actions are taken late or they might not be the exact actions that were needed. Usually, effectiveness of mitigations is measured in terms of actual execution rather than ideal execution. But the CRO can behave overconfidently and assume that the mitigations that they design for the new product will happen exactly as planned. To overcome these and other types of overconfidence that the CRO may fall prey to, they need to do one or more of the following things. Stress testing and scenario analysis. We recommend this on almost all occasions, and this is one occasion where it is particularly applicable. The CRO should be using these stress tests personally to assess what could be different if they were wrong about any of their positions about risks. This approach is particularly well suited for assessing the impact of emerging risks and of looking at alternatives to the complex model. What if we are wrong is the question that the stress test answers. Another could be diverse inside perspectives. If the CRO is in a larger organization, they will likely have a team of folks supporting them. It is important to help the CRO with overconfidence that this team includes a couple of people who tend to have a different point of view and to encourage them to speak their mind. Linking this idea with stress testing, it would be a good idea to have some of the stress test scenarios represent those alternate viewpoints, which will make them a good test of overconfidence. In a smaller company, the CRO will need to get these perspectives from interactions with other company leaders. Another way of, of getting this is from outside perspectives. As mentioned previously, the CRO role does not include any natural links to the company people at the edge of the company activities. So to protect against overconfidence, the CRO needs to deliberately seek out outside perspectives by attending conferences, joining local, regional, or national groups of executives, or even casual conversations will provide a window into the world outside of their own company. Formal feedback from independent reviews of the risk management program can also offer the, the needed outside perspective. It may seem ironic that the CRO, who is responsible to look out for overconfidence in the rest of the company, needs to look out for their own overconfidence. But if they are following some of the above suggestions or other ideas, they can be even more effective in helping to root out and overcome others' overconfidence. And lastly, the CRO needs to find their own memento mori, who brings them back down to earth. For me, it's always been a brother who has never even been slightly impressed by me. It is important that I stay in touch with them too long apart and I start getting too impressed with myself. Good actuaries are hard to come by. And let's face it, they usually don't come cheap. If you're struggling to reasonably meet your actuarial valuation and pricing needs, actuarial risk management can help. ARMS Data and Modeling Institute, or DMI, is a team of talented and experienced actuaries working with our extensive bench of senior consultants. We provide you with the highest quality of actuarial standards at a significant cost savings. Contact ARM today to find out how. So, so Dave, what role do you see emerging technologies like everyone's favorite artificial intelligence and machine learning? What role do these play in addressing the issue of overconfidence in risk management? Having AI there as a as a parallel process with risk, with human risk management is something we'll see eventually. It's it's not anywhere near ready for that now. You you hear great things about it, but we heard great things about it before the different software vendors came out with Alexa and Siri and whatever the other names of the, the AI assistants were called. And those were very disappointing results to some of us, at least. There's an, a, a new generation of those folks going to be rolled out to us 
uh, very soon. Uh, and, and sooner or later, it's going to get to the point where they'll actually work a little bit like the voice uh, from the the ship's computer on on Star Trek. But uh, I, I don't think it's ever going to get quite there. Anyway, the the thing we have to worry about in those situations is, is going to be the temptation to eliminate the human half of the system. I, I think that there's things that, that computers can do that they can do better than humans, and there's things that humans can do better than computers. I, I, I just love remembering the story of, of the chess playing teams between humans and computers. What what was found was that uh, you'll remember the news from, I don't remember how many years ago it was, when uh, Big Blue uh, first beat the human uh, chess master. But they also found that teams of humans and computers beat Big Blue and also beat any human ma uh, master. So that the, using the skills, and I, I've looked into that a little bit, and I'd urge you to as well to see how they teamed up, uh, because they, they tried to use the strengths of AI and the strengths of the humans, where the AI is great at collecting data, analyzing tons of data, looking forward into thousands and hundreds of thousands of paths very quickly, identifying trends, identifying breaks in trends, all things that the computer can do. Humans, on the other hand, they can collect data that's not available electronically. The computer's never going to be able to collect that easily. And they can also do a lot a lot better at, than the computer at interpreting the analysis and strategizing, determining what to do with it. Unfortunately, also, I think that the, the other risk is that uh, it's quite likely that an overconfidence in AI is going to develop. And, and so we, we may end up substituting one overconfidence for another. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see if that happens. You know, I think about it from a investing perspective, you know, the what's the role of the individual active investor, not not necessarily somebody trading every day, but somebody trying to look at fundamentals. And I think there's always a role there, whether it's working with AI or trying to identify what AI is going to come up with and you doing the contrarian thing that that makes sense at the time. So, so Dave, we talked at the beginning about how we think we're practical people. Um, what are some practical steps that these chief risk officers can take to avoid over-relying on complex models? Yeah, that's another one of the over-reliance issues um, that I've seen is that companies that spend a lot of time building a complex model, you know, not, not unusual for companies to spend a year or more building out a, a very complex whole company risk model. Sometimes those companies tend to think of that model as having all the answers. What you have to do is continue to apply old risk assessment techniques and continue to compare the answers that you're getting from different approaches to risk assessment and, and, and then to figure out why are the answers different. Uh, is there something fundamentally that one model's taking into account and the other isn't? And it, there's still a role for subjective judgment. You know, people that, that do complex models make fun of companies that, that still ask people's opinion. You know, what do you think? You know, give me a one to five rating of this. I still think there's a, there's a place for that. The people close to the risk telling you what their feeling is. Again, our favorite answer is stress testing. That's a, a good tool to use to, to keep yourself uh, fresh on these, these uh, complex models. The other thing that I like to do a lot, and again, the, the, the people that are, are very highly quantitatively oriented scoff at this, but I like to use the, the simple normal model assumption and, and multiples of standard, standard deviation to assess things. It's not correct. Most models aren't standard normal models, but it gives you a place to start in thinking about the results you're getting. Also applying the, the rating agencies and the, and the regulatory factor models. Those uh, and, and that whole factor model approach, I like to, to create uh, what uh, is called in Europe, at least, an undertaking specific parameter approach, a USP approach, they call it, which is creating your own version of the rating agency or regulatory models where you've determined the factors. Maybe you've determined them from your complex model. So you should be able to, to look at your results in terms of either something either being a volume variance or a rate variance. 
uh, did, did that factor change or just did the volume of, of activity change? And, and, and that I think is, is the, is one of the best explanations to take to, uh, your non-technical audience of what's going on with a model change. A another simple minded method I, I, I've advised folks to use over the years is that of just aggregating exposures, just, just paying attention to the big numbers. How much are they moving? Uh, which is a subset of that, that, uh, USP approach I just described, but it, it's something that can be used all on its own. Of course, you want to have a, a robust process, model risk management, validating the parameters, validating the data, and, and making sure the calculations are still doing what you want them to do. You, you, you want to have a, a small group of people that you can show your model results to before you release them. I know that uh, the biggest problems I remember ever having when I was a consulting doing these ca calculations for folks was these these projects always ran late and the team just kept wandering out of the building as it got past six, seven, eight o'clock until there's one person left, the, the work's completely done and there's nobody to, to second, you know, to the second pair of eyes on it. And, and that's just, uh, I think the worst experiences I've ever had with bad model results or, or in those exact situations. One of the other, one of the last things I'll suggest is is have the people that do the model, different parts of the model, try and convince each other that their model is right. So if you have somebody doing a credit model, another person doing a mortality model, have them talk to each other and try and explain their models to each other, and get a story then they can live with. So Max, let me ask you a question about this. Uh, what are ways that you can think of that uh, a, a chief risk officer can uh, develop their own internal network at an insurer? Well, well, back in the Stone Ages, you know, when I entered the the workforce, you know, and when I joined the life insurer, I had just graduated from college and and didn't know anyone. I moved to a new city, and I joined a variety of of company sports leagues and participated in some of the organized uh, social events. Uh, getting to meet meet some people in in a new town, you know the other teams were made up of similarly aged people working throughout the company, and little did I realize it at the time. But as I took on more responsibilities, they were doing the same, and it, and it became much easier to establish a rapport with their departments because I already knew so many of them, uh, and and I found that to be really useful. <music> A chief risk officer needs to manage their own overconfidence while also looking for the downsides of overconfidence in their peers who accept and manage risks for an insurer. Honest reminders about fallibility, overcomplicated models, and reliance on metrics, and the possibility of emerging risks improve company resilience. Dave also shared a few ways to overcome our overconfidence bias that have been proven to help. We hope that you've enjoyed this episode of Crossing Thin Ice, presented by Actuarial Risk Management. If you find it valuable, please like, subscribe, and share with your colleagues. Mm -hmm.